welcome back to a brand new episode of Extra Time with Girls on the Ball. We are, of course, in different countries, as you can see. There were not too many upsets in the WSL this week, but there was a bit of a battle in Bristol, and Miedema completed her comeback with a goal in Liverpool. All this on more and more on this week's episode. I'm Rachel. I'm Sophie. And this is Extra Time with Girls on the Ball. This week's episode we will go through the WSL fixtures of course we will run through the championship results and the table and Sophie's going to of course give us a quick rundown on the round table with Nikki Set. so good luck with that nice short and sharp stuff uh, and you're going to also give us your moment of the week so you can start thinking about that now and then we will finish up with a quick look ahead to the final Champions League group matches which kick off tomorrow so looking forward to that one remember if you've not already subscribed to the pod or on YouTube make sure you do so so you do not miss an episode and if you fancy giving us a review do that as well we would love that um, and of course always drop us any comments or any questions on our social medias we are at girls on the ball we'd love to hear from you Okay, so let's run through the WSL results. As I said in the intro, not too many upsets, but I feel like there was a little bit of drama sprinkled here and there. We had Brighton nil, Chelsea three, LJ with two, and Fran Kirby. Uh, Manchester United two, Aston Villa one, Keats with a double, and Daly for Aston Villa. Everton nil, Leicester one, came in with a great goal there. Tottenham nil, Manchester City two, an own goal, and Shaw. Uh, Bristol one, West Ham two, Hayashi, Asai, and Thestrup with the goals. Liverpool nil, Arsenal two, Miedema and Ford getting on the score sheet there. So we will start um, with the Saturday evening kickoff, which you were at, Sophie, which I was not at because I'm back here in Dublin. Um, so I actually feel like I saw more football this weekend than I normally would when I'm working at a game and have an eye on another game and then maybe watch another game when I get home. Um, I feel like I had multiple screens everywhere and was keeping an eye on a lot of stuff. But you were at this one. I watched it on TV. Give me your your summary of the game. Um, Brighton played really well in the first half. They were aggressive in the press. They troubled Chelsea. Chelsea weren't quite at the races and maybe a little bit passive. And while they had the better chances in that first half, like I think Guru Wrighton hit the bar and Frank Kirby blazed one like a volley over from eight yards. Um, but Brighton were really getting to them. And I thought Julia Zigiotti in particular is my person to, to shout out from that first half. She was so active in the press. She was so alert to the balls coming out. She cut out the distribution from Hannah Hampton. Um, she set up play. She set up Beatrice Sari a couple of times, who I thought was probably uh, Brighton's best attacking player on, on the pitch. So um, I thought they did really well in the first half. And then I don't know what Emma Hayes said to them at half time. Um, but yeah, she they came out, they went into another gear straight away. And I think for Brighton, they really had to try and hold on to that for that first 10 minutes. And instead, they let three goals in. So. Uh, it kind of the game got away from them very quickly. I think they pushed uh, Cuthbert and uh, Melanie Lupols up um, higher to try and uh, really infringe on that Brighton midfield area. They were having a bit too much space, I think, maybe in the first half. So she pushed um, Cuthbert and Melanie up um, and it gave them extra support to LJ in the 10 and then Frank Kirby in the 9. And LJ just did what LJ did. You know, it was ridiculous first goal, kind of really instinctive. She made it look so easy. Like she just like stuck out a leg and was like, oh, you know, this is what I do. Um, and then the second one from her was, you know, her 50th goal in senior football. So um, a big, a big mark on her. And she's only 22. That's ridiculous. And then Emma um, Hayes said afterwards that Fran Kirby had her best game in the Chelsea shirt. She played as a number nine. So something maybe we've not seen more recently from her, but she can do it. And she got a, a header, which is probably a bit rare for her um, to score with her head. Um, but yeah, she she was pretty good as well, and they really seemed to click into gear in that second half. Yeah, I was quite impressed with Brighton in the in the first half, but I think in a lot of these games, it's how long can you sustain that level of discipline against a team like Chelsea, and when LJ can score a goal like that, where there's not really much anybody can do about it. Um, you know, I'm not sure how much discipline or or concentration would have prevented that, and I think the timing of her goal and Fran's goal, 46 minutes, 51 minutes was a bit of a one-two punch and suddenly they're two nil down and the games got away from them. So um, yeah, I think that was tricky for them. I thought I thought they did well breaking up Chelsea's link of play as well during the game in the first half, but that didn't seem to work as well in the second half and Chelsea definitely found their rhythm, I think. So yeah, I don't think it was anything too surprising in that fixture. 
Um, moving on then to Manchester United to Aston Villa one with an added level of spice given everything that's gone on at the Conti Cup with Aston Villa fielding an ineligible player um, and there's a lot of talk around should they get knocked out of the competition or should the points be awarded to Sunderland I think that will then damage United's chance of coming as, as a, one of the best um, second place finishes in their group is that right? Uh, yeah, um, so that's if they forfeit just a fixture. If they get chucked out of the competition, then it could get pretty interesting because it's whether they take away all they got, uh, their results in the group stage or just that fixture. So I think it's a decision, um, an interesting decision that the FA have to make. But I think the point is that it's frustrating for everyone involved. It's frustrating for Villa. It was obviously a mistake. Mistakes happen. Um, but, I, I, you know, they kind of can't think about any other team other than the rules it's got it's got nothing to do with Manchester United can it it will impact Manchester United proper, possibly um but it could also impact it could also impact Durham as well so um I think there are so many different moving parts that too many teams have a, a stake in it and it's it's really not like shit for want of a better word that it's happened um but it's, it's, it's just got to be done by the rules, by the tri- tribunal. It should be black and white. It should be, if you field an ineligible player, this is the result, this is the punishment. It shouldn't factor in anybody else. Like Otherwise, you get down a really tricky wormhole if you set that kind of precedent. Anyway, added level of spiciness perhaps there. Um, Manchester United scored early through Nikita Paris, who's been in great form. Um, I do have to say it was pretty sloppy defending from Villa again you know kind of sloppy pass out that was intercepted by Garcia it looked as though they'd managed the Man United attack and that they all they needed to do was clear the ball and instead it was a really sloppy pass out Garcia intercepted crossed it in for Paris um, and she got that early goal I'm kind of surprised actually she didn't start against Chelsea did she and given she's United's top scorer and she's in such good form um, I did think Villa started brightly initially um, and then they struggled to find any kind of rhythm after the goal and I just we've said this before. Villa defensively are so frustrating, and I feel like their style of defending is simply frantic and last ditch, no matter who they're playing. Like that just always seems to be the vibe you get from their defending. Um, so that that was a little bit frustrating. Um, I did enjoy the JC versus Moritz. Uh, I think the, um, the Swiss defender struggled a little bit with her pace. Um, daily not getting enough service, so she was like coming quite deep in that first half to try and find the ball. Um, but yeah, I thought second half. They started much better. They were more of a threat. I think they deserved to get a goal, but I do think that penalty was so soft. Oh my god! I think it was soft as well. I can see, I can see why the ref has sort of decided on it because the arms did come out from Garcia. But my god, it was incredibly, incredibly soft, and she definitely made a meal of it. I think Aston Villa, like I think they had more of a possession um, stats, but United just outcreated them massively, um, and. That's the problem with the Villa this season. They haven't been able to get that service to Daly that they were able to get last season. So, so often in games, she's been sort of um, a lone figure. Yeah, kind of a lone figure out there trying to do everything as well. And when she gets um, isolated, she then starts coming back too deep or trying to defend or trying to get the ball and influence the game in different places instead of being where she needs to be up the pitch. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of a frustrating time for her, I guess, when... She's not getting the service that she requires to to kind of finish off, off games. I do think Man United, though, do look vulnerable at times at the back. And if Villa were more clinical, um, they could have got more goals. But they've not been clinical. I think, um, you know, just at times they were getting in, I think, particularly in the second half. Um, so United will be really pleased to come away with that win. But I do think they, on balance, deserved deserve the win but yeah I think Villa do need to be credited they did come back into it in the second half because in the first half I kind of thought United could be f- far and away out, out from them so um, yeah 2-1 in the end and uh, a bit of a spicy fixture um, I also then had another eye on I don't know how many eyes I had on Everton nil, Leicester 1 because of course these games are all kicking off at slightly different times so we had United Villa at 12 then this started at half past 12 and um, so yeah, I didn't see all 90 minutes, but what I did see, I thought the first half was pretty enjoyable. It seemed pretty transitional, although Leicester probably had the better of it. 
but Everton looked dangerous, but they never looked dangerous enough that they were like getting much on target. I don't actually think they had any shots on target. They had um, chances Catches though. Noise. Yeah, but they weren't getting them on target. And I, I thought Catches Noise again looked good um, and, and looked threatening, but just nothing really ever came from it. And then second half, I don't know what Willie Kirk said in the second half, but second half was Leicester's. Um, definitely the better team. Evidence really struggled to get out of their own half, um, which will be frustrating for them. I think the fact that they created no shots on target will be a real worry. And Courtney Brosnan had to pull off some really good saves. So Leicester probably unfortunate to only score the one goal. But what a goal it was from Cayman. <laughs> Yeah, I think Everton had chances in that first half. I think Emma Bissell came pretty close as well. Um, and they looked pretty good on that kind of counter-attack play. Um, and they were stretching Leicester in that first half. But um, I think it was kind of the theme of that return game at King Power as well. They created in the first half and they just didn't make it count. And then Leicester found their way back into the game, as they did in the second half this time around, and, um, and scored that goal. And it was a great goal from Lena Petterman in the reverse fixture and then this one from Yanis Kamen. I mean, my gosh, the way that she rolled the defender and just took a hit. And Courtney Brosnan was picked, picked the right side, but it was just too good for her to get there. Um, it was just a brilliant strike. So, yeah, and a really important for Leicester as well. It's been a, a while since they've won a game, I think, in terms of the league. Um, they've been really disappointed with that form in that respect because I think they feel that the performances have been there in parts, but they've just let Leeds slip and stuff like that. So, to get back to winning ways in the league and to rise, I don't know if that means they've risen the table, but it we'll get there. Give, don't spoil it. <laughs> no, no, but to give them extra points and to start that that climb up the table is is important for them, especially if they don't want to start getting dragged into whatever is happening. But yeah. I think the commentator said something funny in the first half. He said the most of the testing of of Leicester's goalkeeper came from Leicester defenders sending her balls back, like in quite you know, from quite high up the pitch, quite hard, quite high, quite fast, and, and goalkeeper managed them really well. But I thought it was funny. He was like, they're the biggest test he's had in the game so far has come from her own defence, firing balls back at her. Um, but I know I thought she did really well. Um, then we had a, we had Tottenham versus Manchester City kickoff at, that was a two o'clock game. Um, at least it was a better game than the reverse fixture, I'll say, for Tottenham. Uh, early goal for City and an own goal as well. That would have hurt, I think. That would be really frustrating. I thought from what I saw in this game, maybe City were a little bit flat in the first half. Um, and I think Spurs were unlucky not to get an equaliser. Thomas Thomas was through on goal and had the ball in the back of the net, but she was deemed offside, which was kind of impossible to tell from the angles we had. Um, so we, we couldn't really see it, but... Lionel called it offside but I think I think City were better in the second half they always look so threatening particularly on the wings particularly through your Hemp's and your your Kelly's and um, I just think they look like such a frightening trio up front but yeah they're better second half of course Bunny Shaw scored she saw LJ getting two goals and she was like uh-uh I need to keep my nose in front and um, so that was that was good to see and, and of course as well when they got that first goal there was a, a very nice moment where they held up Jill Ward's shirt and um, I think she was in the stands so that was very touching of course Jill Ward it was announced this week that she had done her ACL gutting for her quite a loss for City you know we've we've talked a lot about how they haven't brought many players in this season Jill Ward being their signing and, and being such a good signing and slotting in so quickly and playing so well and being one of the signings of the season so it'll be gutting to lose her for the season yeah um they're gonna have to adjust quite quickly to life without her I think and I think when someone slots in that easily, it's it's going to take a bit of an adjustment time. Uh, but they've got more than enough quality, I think, to kind of cover that. And especially when you've got the front three that they have who can do what they can do. And you've got Bunny Shaw. I just worry. I do worry that Bunny Shaw, like if you if she picks up a, a niggle or... Don't speak an, that into existence. No, no, no. But like, just like if, if she sprains her ankle even and is out a couple of weeks. I think that creates a real problem for them because then they are looking a bit more threadbare than they do right now. Um, and I wonder if he'll make a move in these final days of the transfer okay. window because of that your rod injury and the kind of out of necessity to try and find some cover, I guess, would be would be interesting. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, City are one of the best teams in the league this season and they've got to be given Most their consistent. credit. Um, Tottenham didn't create all that much in terms of real chances. Um, but the fact that they kept it tighter at the back and didn't concede, what, seven, um, is a massive improvement for them. And I do think they've shown improvement since that 7 0 defeat as well. They've become more resilient and they've become more, uh, maybe less naive, I guess, in certain situations. And they can protect 
protect things a bit better. And we still laugh about the defending like last week against um, West Ham. But, you know, they are improving. They are improving in, in terms of that respect. Yeah, for sure. Um, so interesting one to keep an eye on Man City in terms of players coming in because they have had people going out. Well, yeah. So Dana went to Bay, Bay FC, Dana Castellanos. Um, so that's been interesting. And Julie Blackstad went to Hammerby. Both, understandably, they're not getting minutes. They weren't being played by Gareth Taylor. And they both are at the stage of their careers where they want to be playing regularly. And I think for Dana especially, like Bay FC is a really exciting project. It's the expansion team in the NWSL. Um, something new, some somewhere else new to go and uh, have an impact. So, um, yeah, going to follow her quite closely. But I do think it means that they need to be active in these last three days. In the, a little in bit the more transfer. depth, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, moving across then to the game that you were at, which was probably the most exciting fixture of the weekend. Bristol won West Ham 2. This was, of course, a relegation battle. Both teams are sitting at the bottom of the table on five points. Um, everyone was calling this the proverbial six-pointer, despite the manager's insistence that it wasn't that big a deal, guys. Like, you're all just like making such a big deal out of it. Um, <laughs> you were at this one. Give us your thoughts. It was quite an exciting fixture, particularly when the goals started flowing. I think Lauren Smith was... Um really disappointed when I spoke to her at the end of the match and I think I've got some audio from her to uh, that you can listen to in a bit but um, she it was the first time I've I've heard her sound quite um, what's dejected. the word dejected or defeatist and I'm sure that's like a, just a reaction after the game kind of thing but she was very clear you know they've got 10 cup finals now um, until the end of the season and kind of that they really need to amp it up they started really well they were really energetic um, they had a really good supporting, they had 6,000 in, in the stands, so really good support as well, urging them on. And then the, the first goal for West Ham kind of came against the run of play. Um, they didn't react to the second phase of a defend, like defending across. It's like Trayvon Watcher. I know, and Hanukkah Hayashi, Hayashi had all the space to shift the ball, and it's a really good finish, but she still had all the space in the world to do it. Um, and I think they were really annoyed at that. And then they managed to get themselves back into the game. Fionn Morgan... She had a really great impact last week against Brighton when she came on. Um, and this week, she came on pretty much with her first touch. Well, um, West Ham had the ball in the back of the net. They broke up field, Bristol. Fia Morgan took it basically from the centre line all the way up to the box, beat Katrina Gorey in the box, and then cut it back for Amelie Thestrop to, to send home. So brilliant like solo run from her. Um, and you thought at that point that they were going to kick on, and then the, but then the game just got really super transitional even more so than it was already. And when you've got someone like Asai, you can't let her cut through like the way she did. And she's got the pace to burn and the vision like to, to break through and to break through those lines. And Jess Yu was really, really good yesterday. I thought, given that she's young, she hasn't had many starts for West Ham. Um, she was kind of given the responsibility and she, she provided that assist as well, which was lovely. But yeah, I think Bristol City were just a bit naive in certain situations in terms of the defend defending their areas sometimes they you just need to be a bit more compact and I know they wanted to win the game but when you get yourself level give yourself a little bit more time yeah, rather than stretching be, stretching the play yeah, like that they can be guilty of ball watching I think sometimes and I think we saw that with the first goal but I think it still felt like as the game went on it was just two boxers taking slugs out of each other it was just back and forth and like really going for really high intensity which I really enjoyed and I tweeted afterwards that you know Bristol City don't look out of place in this league like they've got a real fight about them um, and I think we see some really clever tactics sometimes you know she brought on Lisa Evans during the first half changed their formation and um, I said it to you when she made substitutions at half time I said she's really rolling the dice here she's really going for it and bloody hell what an impact within like 90 seconds Fionn Morgan who just kind of come on uh, creates that goal so you know there there is like she's tactically astute and I think sometimes it's just getting that experience under their belts and you know as you say getting getting rid of some of that naivety or, or getting a bit more experience in those situations um but yeah I thought it was a really good game and as you say quite quite exciting for a neutral to be watching um from a West Ham perspective huge win for them on yeah. their second win this season um and a huge three points it takes them above Bristol City it puts them in touching distance of two teams above them um I'm sure Rian Skinner was delighted I'm not sure I understand does this happen in every podcast where my watch decides to chip in? You spoke to both of them afterwards. I'd say it was very nice for Rianne to not be reflecting on a loss again. Uh, yeah, I think she was delighted not to be reflecting on a loss. I think she's done that all too often. 
um, this season. And she was very happy, as you can expect. She um, full of the smiles. Uh, what well, that was nine nine winless games. It ended a, a run of nine win, winless games. So, and as I said, I think last week the the, the performances have been there in 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 parts. Um, they haven't like been playing particularly badly or like not had a half of football where they've played well. Um, if you know what I mean, they've they yeah. they might like against Manchester United they conceded three nil and then they came back in the second half and performed really well. So yeah. there's always been signs that they can do something. Um, but yeah, I think it's um, no, just a relief for her. And I did speak to her after after the game too, and she was um, very happy with her team. A very, she said when uh, Vivi was going down the down the line to score the goal, she was up and she was celebrating on the sidelines because I think you just know how that much that meant to her and, and the squad. I don't know who it was at the end of the game. I don't know whether it was Katerina or who it was decided to like in their excitement jump on princess and yeah Corey. Nearly, i know she's i know she's mini but bloody hell she nearly knocked her over i was like oh my god has she just injured princess um so there was a lot of excitement in that huddle post-match i know you talked about uh lauren smith after the match um and how kind of sad she was i guess you know this would have been such a huge fixture for them to try and get points out of they've already got five on the board they would have really believed that they could do it um so let's hear what she had to say i think the, the performance has been scrappy um, from the start and until the end. You know, it's been one of those games that it's fallen. I think a lot more for them than it has for us. Um, and then ultimately, it's been a huge physical game. Both teams have left everything out on the pitch. A really long game. Uh, overall, the result, I think, yeah, we've let ourselves down a couple of times uh, in front of our own goal. We've not defended properly. That, that, that puts us out of the game. And finally, I know you were very keen to stress pre-match that it wasn't the end of the season. You know, you've got still half the season left to play. You've got to build the squad up again this week ahead of that game against, I think, Aston Villa next weekend. So what's kind of the focus for next week? Yeah, there, there is plenty of football to play. So it's not um, it's not like we're sat here thinking that's it. Um, but I still absolutely think that they are 10 top finals now, uh, playing for our lives at this point. So we're going to have to treat them like that. Um, there's no room for error. There's no to be naive um, 10 games starting out to make sure we stay in the league okay I think like the thing I feel about Bristol right now though is that while this does feel like a big loss I also feel like there's still points in that squad and that this relegation battle isn't over and it is we're going to look at the at the table in a minute it is still pretty compact and tight down around there from 7th down to, to 12th it's not a huge leap so They've got goals in them, that's for sure. Um, and they just need to tighten up defensively a little bit. But they do have goals. They put up a fight every time they play. Against Brighton last week, yes, they lost in the 95th minute, but they fought their way back twice. You know, they've got character about them. Um, and I think, I don't know, I have a real soft spot in my heart for Bristol City, all like from the time that they were Bristol Academy. You know, we used to yeah. love going down down there back in the day and, Following their Champions League journey. <laughs> yeah, it's it's such a people's club. And you could tell, like, you know, what they're doing in terms of fan engagement is incredible. They got 6,000 people in to watch a game against West Ham. Like, not many other teams are managing those kind of numbers against the non-top four sides. So um, it's incredible. I had great fun in the stadium once again. You know, there was a brass band playing throughout. They were playing beforehand as well. There was what I like to call the disco that you laugh about me, laugh, laugh at me about. Um, beforehand a rave maybe you had the raving robins as well that was great fun that made my day but then also like i know i put up a video of like the inflatable apple race. oh my god the response to this from i know some people was absolutely ridiculous and I, i'm just like we can't police fun like there's going to be different like games have to cater to different kinds of fans right if you want to be there for the football you go and talk football at half time with your friends and get a cup of tea or you want to go to the pub beforehand or afterwards, or you get a cider, which is plenty of in Bristol. And was the point of the frigging apples bouncing <laughs> yeah. down the pitch? But there's always going to be this kind of activations, and we've seen it in the men's game as well. You have mascot races and hit the crossbar challenges at halftime in the men's game. It's nothing new. It's it's just a way, it was, it was fun and it was funny. And I just looked up, I took the video because I looked up and I just saw these giant apples rolling around the pitch and I was like, this is hilarious. Um, but I don't think we can start policing fun. I know when we come on to Nikki Doucette's piece a bit later, that's probably what people have taken 
you know, to heart. But I do think like every club is doing fun things for to activate different fan bases. I think this idea that it makes the game look bad or that it makes it look unserious is, is ridiculous. It's this isn't you know a, a thing isolated to women's football. This is in sport everywhere. People try and entertain fans at halftime, and I think the main thing is. All these people are in the ground already, right? They're warm fans. They're probably going to come back. Whether you like halftime or you don't like halftime, that's not why people are there. So if you're at halftime and there's something you don't particularly enjoy, just say to yourself, this probably isn't for me. And that's all right, because the football's going to start in 15 minutes and you'll be grand. So go and get yourself a cup of tea and chill out. So I, I think um, I was also inspired by, I don't know what you've been watching on TikTok, but um, I've been served a lot of Benny, Benny the Bull from Chicago. Like literally about so 20, have I. 20 I videos. watched one video. <laughs> and they're absolutely hilarious. He's he's brilliant. He's like does all of these dances. He tries to shoot in the bus. He just gets it in a lot of the time. But well. basketball is so unserious. So. Um he throws popcorn over people and you know, that's kind of the element of, of kind of the breaks and half time that you can bring over and that isn't such a I don't know. I know purists want to think about the football, and I get that. I'm there to watch football. This doesn't impact the football. It doesn't impact it's half the time. Football. Chill out. Right. Speaking of football, we have one more match to, to get through, which is Liverpool nil, Arsenal 2. Um, I did manage to watch most of this. Uh, and I did think, you know, Liverpool were missing Taylor Hines, which I thought was going to be a big loss for them because she's been so good this season and has been captain in the squad as well. Um, I thought it was great having Holland back in midfield. Um, I really enjoyed the battle between Nagano and Miedema in that first half. I thought that was really good clash. Um, you know, I thought the first half, I think it's the same old kind of story with Arsenal where they struggle really to put their chances on target and they could be a little bit repetitive in in their what they're trying to do. Um, sometimes they look a, like they're trying to play too fancy a bit of football through the middle. It can look really congested sometimes and you know, sometimes you're like, Jesus, just put the ball over the top and Beth Mead will bury it. Like we saw what they did against Reading. So sometimes it just felt a little bit congested in there with so many players. And I think someone, I think it was maybe Tim Stillman pointing out that the pitch looked quite dry, which he thought was maybe slowing down balls forward. And and perhaps that kind of slowed down their, their freedom up front. But yeah, I thought Liverpool did well because they are disciplined in defence. So you need to be smart when you're, you're getting around them. They forced them out wide. Um and that was, I guess, what they wanted to do. You know, that learning from that first game when Arsenal put in 101 different crosses and couldn't make it count. And I think Liverpool were thinking about the same thing. And they made the, they were so disciplined in that defensive area that they made the middle, they made the middle of the field quite congested as well, which meant that you know they had to go out wide to forward um, down the left quite often, and it was just creating less space in the middle. Um, so I think that was a good tactic in the first half especially from from Liverpool they kind of were really disciplined in that in that respect um and i think they showed a lot more discipline compared to like last week i was surprised about the amount of changes he made you know Covisto was not on the pitch um changed the goalkeeper as well Rachel Laws came in for the first time in a while so made a few changes uh Lungard got her first start, uh, start of the season as well um so he wasn't afraid to to shake things up a bit i think um, and give other people a, a try and it did work for a good portion of the game but Arsenal's quality just shone through. It felt a little bit like they set up to not concede and I think that showed I think they only had one shot on target um, but yeah in the second half Miedema was very much in her final do it myself era you know you know when Viv gets like that and I think when she gets like that she could be very dangerous shooting from outside the box which is something Arsenal didn't really seem to want to do they wanted to kind of play it in so um a great goal from her a huge weight off her shoulders it did take a bit of a deflection but I think it came right over Law's hands but the power of it there was just no keeping it out so you could tell when Viv celebrates how much a goal means to her and as well how much the, the other teammates celebrate with her is always lovely to see um so yeah it was brilliant to see her back and, and she spoke really well post-match yeah, she did. She spoke about how like she was starting to feel like herself again, um, post winter break. And I think Jonas mentioned it as well, like, you know, players take time and it, they're not all gonna be Beth Mead to come back like instantly and hit the ground running and it's perfect well, not quite perfect, but you know what I mean. Pretty much pretty perfect. Good. Pretty much mm -hmm. perfect straight away. And I think especially the way that Miedema has talked about her body and the way that she 
overthinks. Tr- didn't tr- yeah, overthinks and didn't trust her knees and kind of like that. And the fact that her recovery was a little bit more convoluted, I think, than, than Beth's as well. The fact that she had to have another surgery um, probably didn't help that kind of mindset. So she just needed a bit of time and it was always just going to be ticking them. It's like with Beth, ticking them off when you get your first goal. When you get your first appearance, when you get your first goal, going through the motions and, you know, she'll hit the ground running now, I'm pretty sure. And you always have to remember as well, she is playing a deeper role. So goals aren't going to be as, like, there'll be a bit more few and far between than, than what we're used to seeing when she played in the nine. But she was playing some lovely football and some lovely passes. And another player that we need to point out is Fox as well. I think she settled in really well. She had a, played a part in both goals, both Miedema's and um, Ford's goal, uh, finding Russo, who then found Ford. So great to see her involved. She did get player of the match. Uh, and that was Jonas Eidevall's 100th game and his birthday. So um, Pretty good day. All round. Understandably, very calm post-match and not especially excited, but I'm sure he had a cake or something on the bus back. Um, so that means that Chelsea stay on top on 31 points, City behind on 28, Arsenal are in third on 28 because City have a better goal difference. United have managed now to open up a gap in fourth. They're on 21 points with Liverpool and Spurs below on 18. And then it's quite tight in the rest of the table. You've got Leicester in seventh on 13 points, Villa behind on 12, Everton and Brighton on 11. West Ham on eight and Bristol on five. So everyone's just within a game of each other, which is keeping it nice and tight at the bottom. Um, Speaking of tables, let's have a look at the championship because there were some interesting results in the championship. Wasn't there just? (laughs) Blackburn Rovers nil, Sunderland two, Durham nil, Watford two, huge win. Sheffield nil, Southampton one, Birmingham one, London City Lionesses nil, Lewis two, Reading two, huge comeback for Reading because Reading were two nil down. And they had a player sent off. Uh, Palace nil, Charlton won. So Charlton are still on top on 29 points. This is where it gets... you got to stick with me on this. Sunderland are in second on 28. Southampton in third on 27. Now they're all on 14 games. In fourth, we have Birmingham on 26 points. And fifth is Palace on 24 points. Both of them are on 13 games. So they've both got a game in hand. Down the bottom then, we've got Lewis and Watford on nine points. The former sitting above due to goal difference. London City Lionesses and Reading are only above them by three points on, on 12 points. So it's also worth pointing out as well that Lewis have a game in hand on Watford and Reading have two games in hand. So even the bottom isn't, you know, standard. <laughs> Stuff can happen down there as well. So definitely uh, a league, as we say, every week worth keeping an eye on because it's very exciting and there are upsets on the reg, I think. If I'm not wrong, though, Reading's games in hands are Crystal Palace and Birmingham. So, um, not exactly the easiest. That's not the easiest for them if you're thinking about who's fighting for the promotion at the top of the table. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. This last few games of the season, it's like Absolutely. it finishes on the 28th of April, though. So, it finishes a bit earlier than the WSL. So, um, yeah, it's going to be quite a tight run in, I think. It's going to be one to keep an eye on every week. Yeah, no doubt we'll see more upsets. Um, okay, so if you were at the round table with Nikki Doucette earlier this week, can you give our listeners a one minute kind of rundown of what that was about and talk to us about Glastonbury because that seems to be the line that has come out of it. It is stressing everybody else out because, I mean, I, like many people on Twitter, don't really understand the link between Glastonbury festivals and a football match. So it's, so essentially it's about Newco. So Newco is a new independent company that's taking over from the FA, like the charge of the WSL and the championship next season. And it means that it, it it's, finally getting some independence and it always kind of had to happen you know the FA has looked after um, the two leagues for the last 40 well the the WSL for the last 14 years and then whenever WSL 2 came in in front of that so they've been in charge they've done really like I know people don't like like you know congratulating the FA but they have done a really good job they've seen it through some choppy waters they've made sure the investment is there they've got the big like Barclays sponsorship on board um, got the TV deals and all of that and they've made it a kind of a, a league that um, is now the most watched league in the world you know the numbers show that so I think they deserve a, a big pat on the back for that um, but it always had to come out from under the control at some point they can't fund it forever they can't look after it forever and for it to really fulfill its potential it had to go into another organization and for a while people were talking about the Premier League but I think everyone involved in the game was a little bit concerned about that. I know maybe not everyone, like Emma Hayes, I think, said she wouldn't mind the Premier League taking over and stuff like that. But I think we don't want it just to be, you know, 
eaten up by Copy men's paste. football. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, but if you take it into the Premier League, it's going to be eaten up by men's football. The Premier League is there to serve men's football. Um, and everything that we do then is going to be in the shadow of or replicating what's happened in men's football. And I think there's a real recognition that there's a um, real chance here, a real opportunity to grow the women's game in a different way. That doesn't mean completely separate, but like can it has its own USP and unique elements that we can uh, channel and that we can do differently to, to what the men's game does. And it's shown in audience stats, you know, the audience that the women's game is is attracting is, are different to to what the men's men's game. They're really unlocking a new audience. So Nuco is starting in the summer. Um, they're in the legal, like doing all of the legal do- documentation at the moment. And Nikki Doucet is the CEO of that company. Um, it was announced, I think, in November last year that she'd be CEO. Nikki is from Nike, I think, of the past. She's also Canadian, by the way, guys. So she's Canadian. American. Yeah, she's Canadian, not American. Um, uh, very has a very strong uh, oot to her accent, so um, you could definitely tell the Canadian in her. But yes, so she sat down with the media last week, and I didn't really pick up on the Glastonbury thing so much until afterwards. Like I was sitting in the room, I didn't pick up on it then. What she was kind of saying is that they need to build something that stresses the players and the and the fans. So basically, or obsesses was her word. So obsessive, a, a league that obsesses players and fans so that they build the stories around the game and make it a really good experience for the fans to be there. And I know you and I, Rachel, have talked a lot about fan experience and what that looks like. And, you know, we went to Angel City last summer and had a brilliant time in the, in the, the crowd, in the fan area of the crowd, you know, the Angel City fans. Um, but probably didn't watch much of the football in, in that respect. So yeah, I, think I found it quite distracting. Yeah, it, it, it's trying to find that happy medium between bringing people in and giving them a really good day out and having that entertainment factor, but also having the focus on the football, which is what English football is about, essentially. Um, and I think that's what I got from that. And the kind of the Glastonbury comment, I don't know, it's, it's been taken as a headline, I think. It is a headline, you know, um, I'm not sure it was the right phrasing necessarily to come like she was probably about. trying to engage with an English audience. So she was like, what do English people really get excited about? Glastonbury. <laughs> and everyone's like, wait, what? You want to make football a festival? <laughs> um, so I'm not sure. Yeah, it was a bit weird. But like, I also take it with a bit of a pinch of salt. She's not going to make English women's football into a festival. And it's not like they're, um, I, I really didn't get the feel that they're trying to what's the word make it like child friendly well they they have been forever but you know they're not trying to like um i don't know make it sort of immature i think they're really concerned they're, they're really thinking about what the product is and how they can appeal to different ranges of fans um from the diehards to the new and how they can get new people in um and what that experience looks like and i think you've seen it like with arsenal as well like they've tried different things they've had fan marches They've had bands in the stadium. They've had, you know, um, things going on in the the the, walk, the tunnels behind the where the the spectators sit. There's stuff going on um, that people are just trying and seeing what what clicks and what doesn't click. And it's going to take a minute, but yeah, it's going to be. We've talked a lot about the different demographics that there are and how you know not to infantilize it and make it fo- totally focused on kids. It does mean there's going to be stuff. They're not going to keep everyone happy all the time. So sometimes it's going to be stuff that maybe doesn't target you, but it doesn't mean that you, you shit all over it and it's wrong. So we can't say football's for everybody and then be like, I don't like that. Keep it out of the game. So there's going to be trial and errors. And I think the main thing to take away is that there's football clubs involved in these decisions as well. So it's not like Nikki's going to come in and be like, I think we should have this and then click her fingers and everything changes. So but we can probably count down a little bit. Anyway, very quickly, give me your moment of the weekend. Sophie. Um, well, I was going to go with Miedema's Mide- goal because I went with Bess when she scored, so I'm going to go with Miedema's. But I'm also going to go with the Raving Robins um, because <laughs> that cheered me up massively. I was having a pretty stressful day yesterday and um, the Raving Robins were, were massively cheer- cheering me up. So, yeah, big up well to them. 
Lovely. Um, finally, we have got the group uh, games, the final group games of the Champions League coming up this week. Chelsea are, of course, already through, but we're going to see them anyway um, in Paris to take on Paris FC. And then we're going to head to Frankfurt for Eintracht Frankfurt versus Rosengard. So we will do our very best to take you on that journey with us. So keep an eye on your podcast apps because hopefully we'll be dropping another episode later in the week. Speaking of apps, Make sure you're subscribed. I know I told you already, but you might not be um, to make sure you never miss an episode. So whether that's on your podcast app or on YouTube, um, drop us a review again if you fancy it. And if there's anything you'd like us to touch on next week, um, reach out to us on social media. We are there at Girls on the Ball. But until then, we will see you in Europe during the week. Bye.